For more than half a century, the basic tenets of liberalism were so well ingrained in Western democratic societies that most people took them as immutable. That's been shaken over the past decade and more as illiberal leaders have gained traction with more strident ideas and political agendas. Francis Fukuyama's recent book grapples with those challenges. It's called Liberalism and Its Discontents. He's a senior fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. And Francis Fukuyama joins us now from Palo Alto, California. And he's always welcomed on this program. Great to see you again, Professor. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me back on. A delight. We are actually, before we talk about um, this current book, we're going to have a little fun with you about, um, well, let's call it your most famous book. Because, and you know all about this chat GPT thing, which is the artificial intelligence that's, uh, you know, basically making your life a nightmare because all of your students can fudge all their <laughs> essays now and you never know if they wrote it or didn't. But here's somebody on Twitter named Jonathan P. Sign who posted this exchange from chat GPT. Write a short paragraph of Francis Fukuyama correcting a misunderstanding of his book, The End of History and the Last Man, and do it in the voice of a California Valley girl. And this is what he got. My gosh, like, I feel like people are totally misunderstanding my book, The End of History and the Last Man. Like, I'm not saying that history is over and we've reached the end of progress or anything. That's just so not what I meant. Like, what I'm trying to say is that with the fall of communism and the spread of liberal democracy, we've reached the end point of humanity's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as a final form of human government. But that does not mean that history is over. It's just the end of a certain phase of history. And also, the last man is not about a physical end of a human being. It's more about the spiritual emptiness and lack of purpose that can come with achievement of all our goals. Got it? Okay, Professor. Did ChatGPT basically get you right, though? Uh, well, you know, it's notorious for actually getting on number of facts wrong. I think that if you use it properly, you've got to interact with it and correct things that are not right. So if it had been up to me, I would have, uh, I would have made some emendations to that. But it's pretty good as a first uh, draft. It's an attempt to push back at your critics, though, as you have. And yes, they did it in Valley Girl language, but, but, um, but they're onto something there, aren't they? Well, I think that the main point is really that the end of history wasn't a cessation of events. It's really, where is progress leading us? And I think that I still believe that it is leading us towards some form of liberal democracy because I don't think any of the alternatives out there, especially the strict authoritarian ones, are really going to do any better. So uh, you're still okay with Martin Luther King's the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's still a good thing for us to believe in? Well, I think if you take a long-term view of human progress, uh, that's correct. Having said that, Winston Churchill is supposed to have said history is one damn thing after another. Is that probably more accurately describing what history is? I think in the short run, you know, we go backwards, we go sideways, uh, a lot of things happen. But I do think that, you know, if you think about uh, the moral arc and the greater belief in human equality that's been going on for centuries, I do think that there has been moral progress. Do you think this AI, this artificial intelligence, is good for liberalism? Well, I'm not sure that it's good for any particular political doctrine. I guess the big question is whether it will replace or supplement human capabilities. I, I'm reasonably optimistic that the supplement part will be very useful and the replace part will happen, but it won't be the dominant uh, effect of, of AI. But, you know, what do I know? <laughs> okay. Thanks for playing along there with that look back at one of you. Uh, your previous books. Let's hit now on the book that you've got out, Liberalism and Its Discontents. And, uh, and even though you don't explicitly say this in the book, Sigmund Freud is mentioned a couple of times, but you don't explicitly say that this title is sort of a takeoff on his civilization and discontents. Can I assume that it is? Well, sure. I mean, Freud's book was really about how civilization is necessary. You know, we, we couldn't have society without civilized rules. And yet every individual strains against them because they don't like the rules and they, you know, they feel unhappy and unfulfilled. And I think 
in many ways, liberalism is like that. I think that it's a kind of necessary form of government, but you know, it, it, it doesn't satisfy everybody. And I think particularly in recent years, there have been some pretty systematic attacks on liberalism coming from both the right and from the left. And you said in, in this new book that liberalism has begun to look like an old and worn out ideology. What do you think caused it to lose its vitality? Well, uh, there's a couple of things. It's actually evolved so that you have versions of liberalism that really don't sit well with people. On the right, you had the rise of what's sometimes called neoliberalism, which is really an economic interpretation of liberal economics that really carries the, the, the market-oriented side you know, too far, denigrates the role of the state, and I think that was responsible for increasing inequality over the last you know, several decades, uh, for loss of jobs, uh, you know, the kind of world that, that has left a lot of people behind. And on the left, liberalism has evolved into progressivism, which oftentimes is really not liberal in the sense that you know, the most fundamental virtue in, in a liberal society is tolerance. But a lot of people on the progressive left are really not tolerant of views that aren't uh, their own. And I think that's you know, led to sort of cancel culture and a lot of things that are going on in university campuses and in the media and so forth. Let's pick those apart a bit. So the, the first, the neoliberalism, you're referring to sort of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, um, uh, Professor Friedman, Chicago School Economics, that kind of thing. Somewhere along the line, that was really in vogue. And then I think you suggest in the book that it became kind of like religion and lost its way. What happened there? Well, look, any doctrine you know, begins with a core of truth. And I think in the 1970s, you had stagflation that was produced in many cases by the overregulation of modern economies. And so we began to deregulate, but we just carried it too far. And especially with the deregulation of the financial sector that began in the late 80s, uh, we basically let these big banks take unacceptable risks and it all blew up. Uh, you know, there are a series of financial crises during the 1990s, but the big one occurred in the U.S. with the subprime uh, crisis in 2008, uh, and we're still paying a price for that because what happened was a lot of well-to-do people managed to, to survive that pretty well. They recovered after a year or two, but millions of Americans lost their homes. It had consequences way outside of the United States, increased economic uh, inequality. And I think ultimately, you know, the kind of populism that you saw emerge in the 2010s was a direct consequence of that kind of economic policy. And alternatively, on the far left, do you as a person who makes his living on a university campus find it particularly galling that one of the worst places that culture cancel, excuse me, cancel culture seems to happen is on post-secondary campuses all over North America? Well, I don't know, especially galling. I mean, it is a pretty narrow slice of life overall, but you know, universities are supposed to be dedicated to academic freedom and to being able to make any argument that you want. And it's very hard, especially when you get to certain particular topics having to do with race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. Uh, you know, there are real limits as to what, what you can say um, openly. One of the frequent criticisms that liberalism has run into is that it wants to subvert tradition and that it wants to make the entire world better nevertheless. And here's an example of that. This is from George W. Bush's second inaugural back in 2005, where he said, it is the policy of the United States to seek and support the growth of democratic movements and institutions in every nation and culture with the ultimate goal of ending tyranny in our world. Now, put President Bush's record aside, is it still okay for liberals to want to see the entire world become more liberal and more democratic? Well, this is a big problem. I think that um, liberalism is based on the idea that all human beings uh, have an equal degree of dignity that should be protected uh, by rule of law, by political institutions. But I think that the power of any one country, even a big powerful one like the United States, really 
should be limited because we don't have a right to simply turn everybody in the world into you know, liberal copies of ourselves. And I think that the Bush administration made that mistake in the invasions uh, of Afghanistan and Iraq where uh, the agenda turned into you know, something of a moral crusade in, in societies that had very different histories and cultural traditions. And I think part of the pushback against uh, this kind of expansive liberalism you know, was the direct result of these mistakes in American foreign policy. Let's compare and contrast that with President Joe Biden's State of the Union address last night in which he asked people in reference to Ukraine, would we stand for the right of people to live free from tyranny? Now, obviously, he wanted yes to be the ringing answer, but as he looked out into that hall of congressional representatives, uh, probably a third of whom really don't want to have anything to do with Ukraine, how would you gauge the difference in tone between Bush of 2005 and Biden of 2023? Well, I think you have to start with a basic difference in the situations of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Ukraine was a functioning democratic society, a relatively free one. I have visited there quite a lot over the last uh, uh, seven, eight years. Uh, and it was attacked, uh, you know, in a way that has not occurred in Europe since 1945, where one big power just marches its ar army across an international uh, border. And I do think that that is a threat to the entire democratic order that was created after 1991 in the fall uh, of the former Soviet Union. Iraq was really much more a war of, of, of choice. Uh, you know, we could have left it alone. Uh, it really did pose a certain kind of threat, but certainly not an imminent one that required that kind of military response. And so I do think the underlying uh, circumstances were quite different. The other thing is that Ukraine you know, could actually be a real European country with basically free liberal democratic institutions. I think the likelihood that Iraq was ever going to turn out that way was, was for various reasons, historical reasons, much lower. Why do you think half the Republican Party in your country doesn't see it that way? Uh, I'm not sure it's half the Republican Party, but I think a lot of it is actually the, um, the, the extreme polarization. You know, basically for many Republicans, they don't actually have a firm set of guiding principles. They're simply opposed to whatever the Democrats are doing or whatever Biden is doing. And I think you see uh, evidence of this here. It's, it's kind of amazing what's happened to the Republicans in foreign policy. When Obama was president, they relentlessly criticized him for being too soft, you know, for the reset and the attempt to improve relations with Putin's Russia. And now, you know, half of them actually seem to think that Putin is better than Zelensky or that, you know, the Russians actually have something to teach us. And I think it's just a testimony to the extreme degree of polarization that has beset the United States. Uh, it's been going for the last 20 years, but it certainly got a lot more uh, intense after the election of Donald Trump. Hmm. Do you think the West's support of Ukraine is part and parcel of a larger ideological war, like you mentioned World War II, such as this is this, is this generation's war against Nazism, for example? Well, both Russia and China have authoritarian political systems, and both of those countries have been arguing in recent years that liberal democracy is old and obsolete and isn't really up to the challenges you know, that, that we face today. Putin gave an interview in 2019 where he said liberalism, by which he means not American liberalism, but a basically free rule of law society is obsolete and that his form of authoritarian government is better. The Chinese have been saying uh, a version of this as well, that the West is in terminal decline, uh, that the future belongs to countries like China, like Russia. Uh, and so I think that you know, it's important if we want to maintain a free way of life that we push back uh, against this. I think that this is a wrong argument. It's an argument that's going to lead to the enslavement of a lot of people. And uh, if we don't defend ourselves, you know, we're going to be victims of that as well. Well, I want to play you a clip now of somebody from Russia who believes, uh, <laughs> who does not agree with you and believes very much that uh, the spread of liberalism uh, to his country would be a terrible thing. Alexander Dugan, the Russian nationalist, his daughter died um, 
Was it earlier this year in a car, car explosion or last year? I can't remember now. In any event, you and he were on this program almost exactly eight years ago today. And this is what he said in response to something you said about the subject of liberal, liberalism universally. Sheldon, if you would. The, the most uh, essential thing was said now by Mr. Fuk Fukuyama. He uh, thinks, as well as the many of liberals, uh, any liberal, that human nature is the same, that uh, human nature transcends uh, cultures. That is the problem of anthropology, the Western anthropology, and above all, uh, Anglo-Saxon anthropology is based on the concept of the human being as individual, as a positive individual with fully autonomous or partly autonomous content. But Russian uh, anthropology or Islamic anthropology or Indian anthropology or Chinese anthropology are absolutely different. For us, for us Russians, the human to be human, it is the same uh, as to belong to the whole. The suggestion that we don't have the same anthropology, we in the West and those in Russia, that the individual does not belong to the individual, but rather to the whole. Eight years later, how do you respond to what Mr. Dugan has to say? Well, you know, Dugan is right that the degree of individualism that people in the West uh, feel and practice, and particularly in the United States, differs. There are, more, there are other societies that are more collectivist than, um, uh, than you know, our Western societies. But I think that the underlying human being uh, is, you know, is, does really have universal characteristics. And sometimes it requires a degree of economic development and education for that you know, full flourishing of a human personality uh, to come out. And so I think that over time, you look in the West itself, we were much more collectivist, you know, back in the Middle Ages or in earlier periods of our evolution. But as we have gotten richer, as we've gotten better educated, people do want freedom of choice. And I think it's universally the case that people really don't like living in a brutal dictatorship, uh, including Russians, including Chinese people. And you know when the pressure from the state gets too uh, authoritarian and dictatorial, they rise up in rebellion against that. And I don't think that is necessarily culturally determined. Uh, trade with China was supposed to have an impact on that. Trade with China was supposed to make them more like us and less like they were. Do you think that's working? Well, it hasn't worked. You know that's. Um, that's what we used to call modernization theory. And obviously, that hasn't worked in China as they've gotten richer over the past uh, couple of decades. That doesn't mean that in the long run, uh, a China that has a big middle class, very educated people that travel a lot aren't going to want, if not a democracy, at least a more open and free society so that they can really make their own choices. I think that that's one of the things that happens when you um, you know, when you get more educated and you begin to realize that the world has all these possibilities that, you know, you would like to, uh, you would like to explore or that your political system, you know, really is preventing you from, from uh, flourishing. Uh, so I don't think the answer is finally uh, written. We saw mm -hmm. under zero COVID that actually Chinese get mad about things, you know, and they mm -hmm. don't actually like uh, bad decisions that their government takes. And I think one of the things that we've seen in the past year is that a dictatorship led by a single individual is inevitably going to make mistakes. I think the Ukraine war was an example of that, and I think that zero COVID was an example of that. And I think that the durability of these regimes making mistakes like this is not guaranteed at all. Well, let's go back to Ukraine's and, and Russia's involvement there since you've mentioned it here. Uh, you know, there's this expression that, that Russian slash Soviet leaders over the years have been able to do basically whatever they wanted to because they have always been able to depend on the Russian people being willing to suffer uh, innumerable indignities um, and as much as any regime needed in order to get away with what they wanted to get away with. Uh, Putin certainly depending on that uh, to prosecute his war in Ukraine. 
Do you see any evidence that, that that's still not the case? Uh, no, I think that uh, unfortunately the degree of kind of nationalism and support for the regime has gone up since the war started. I think this is something that happens in every society when you know, they get into war. The question is how durable is that support going to be down the line? Uh, you know, in 1917, you had a big revolt in, you know, in the Russian army uh, in World War I when people simply got tired of fighting and dying uh, at this level. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to happen in Russia, but I don't think it's inevitably the case that the Russian people will endure any amount of indignity uh, simply because they're Russian. Uh, okay, but so far, and uh, I guess who knows if this number is accurate, but we heard it the other day, 200,000 Russians have died in the prosecution of this war so far, which just seems like an extraordinarily high price to pay for what certainly Western eyes on this side of the Atlantic would seem to be very little payoff. Um, you know, that, that sure looks like Russians are prepared to accept a ridiculous amount of suffering as part of their anthropology, no? Well, you know, it, they, they obviously have a greater tolerance for this. I mean, that level of casualties in a Western democracy, because we have democracies and people can protest and complain, uh, is going to be much greater. And Russians don't have that uh, opportunity. But, uh, you know, there is a, a breaking point uh, for all of these apparently strong regimes. It, you know, Afghanistan saw actually a lower level of casualties. But one of the things that discredited the late Soviet uh, regime was the fact that they were losing people in what seemed to be uh, a pointless war. Okay, let's come back to liberal democracies here and we'll, we'll, we'll I guess, continue with the original tweet that started this conversation. Uh, your fear that accomplished liberal societies feature, quote, a lack of purpose or a spiritual emptiness. Can you give us some advice on how we might deal with those two problems? Well, uh, you know, that goes to the essence of a liberal society. And in, in a liberal society, we agree that we're going to disagree about the most important things. We're not going to define our uh, common aims in terms of a religious idea or, you know, a, a very strong national idea because we live in pluralistic societies where people are able to do uh, what they want. And I think that, you know, the degree of pluralism that we have, especially here in North America, is such that it's hopeless to think that we're going to ever, you know, march in the same direction in terms of basic religious values or, or you know, we're, we're not simply one uh, ethnicity. And I think that, you know, in many respects that becomes a strength. The, you know, it's kind of a cliche to say that our strength is in our diversity, but in fact, you know, the ability to absorb immigrants, to uh, actually create a society out of, you know, a very complex texture of ethnicities, races, uh, and the like uh, is, you know, something that I think becomes necessary as your economy and your society uh, develop. And so, you know, I think we find in a democratic society that our communal satisfaction is not given to us by the fact that we're like one people marching in one direction, but we still have community. You know, we can still exercise religious freedom. We can join the church of our choice. Uh, we can join private associations. You know, we have many alternatives for a communal life. It's simply not going to be one single uh, direction dictated by one single person at the top. And I think that, uh, you know, is a much more desirable expression of our in, intrinsically social natures, you know, than an authoritarian regime provides. I have to tell you, from this side of the border, I, th I think it's fair to say most Canadians looking south at what's transpired in the United States over the past, well, let's say decade, but, but really I think most Canadians would say over the last five years, is a country that has been, um, you know, taken hostage by the extremists of both parties, um, probably more so by the extreme wing of the Republican Party than the Democrats. But having said that, as I watched the State of the Union last night and I saw a president of the United States from the Democrat Party uh, reaching out to shake hands with the Speaker of the House, the newly elected Speaker of the House, who's a Republican, and then after that, paying homage to the longest-serving uh, Senate Minority Leader in American history and Mitch McConnell, 
That to me looked like potentially the beginning of a moment of more moderation and more reaching out. I don't want to be naive about this, but how did you see it? Uh, I hope that <laughs> I hope that that's correct. You know, I do think that the Republican Party has basically followed Donald Trump off of a cliff. Uh, you know, the future of that party and of the country as a whole cannot, you know, cannot lie in a preoccupation with this supposed stolen election back in 2020. And I think we've seen plenty of evidence that a lot of Republicans are kind of sick of that and think that they've got another agenda that is not being addressed uh, as a result of that. And so I do think that, you know, you're going to get a different kind of Republican candidate in the future that hopefully will return to, you know, the kind of real policy differences that existed between Republicans and Democrats that were serious, you know, differences of opinion about what we ought to do about immigration, about jobs, about a lot of different issues, and not this preoccupation, uh, you know, with kind of, <laughs> you know, the, the psychoses of one, you know, one particular uh, individual that's been leading the party. Uh, so, you know, maybe that will play out over the next couple of years before the 2024 election. We'll have to see. Uh, I guess the other thing, you know, since I was in Canada recently, I do think that part of the reason that the U.S. is so different from Canada really does have to do with its racial uh, history. I, I've always thought that, you know, if <laughs> somehow the Civil War had ended up differently and the South had gone off as a separate country, the United States, the rest of the United States would actually look a lot like Canada. But that didn't happen. We stayed a single country. And I think that that racial legacy has really very much shaped the politics and certainly lies at the base of a lot of the polarization that we are experiencing today. You know, the whole controversy over wokeness, which really started as a disagreement about how to interpret that racial history. And so, you know, our situations are different. I think you Canadians are perfectly right in scratching your heads and wondering, you know, what the hell is going on south of the border. Uh, I do that myself, but, you know, here we are. Indeed. In our last minute here, let's finish up on this. I, I, I love the way your book ended because it was a call for moderation uh, as, a, as a saving grace for liberalism going forward. And I sit here in a studio named after a former premier of Ontario who's the most successful politician in this province of the last hundred years. Uh, William Grenville Davis was his name. And he often used to say, my mother always told me, Billy, moderation in all things. And that made him very successful following that path. How possible do you think it is that we can rediscover our inner spirit of moderation? Well, I think that uh, we've got to do that in, in, in some way. You know, a lot of our problems were based on this idea that if you have a little bit of something that looks good, then 10 times as much or 100 times as much is going to be 10 or 100 times better. And so, you know, maybe uh, markets are good, but it doesn't mean that a market for everything is going to be the solution to all of society's uh, problems. Or, you know, our individual autonomy is good, but complete freedom to choose everything about our lives at every moment in our lives is not a great thing. And I think, you know, there will be a moment when people will begin to realize that maybe their longings and satisfactions will be better satisfied if, you know, they don't try to double or triple, you know, whatever it is they've, they've started out on. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see. Uh, our institutions could also be changed to encourage uh, more moderate uh, points of view. Uh, and I think that's the task that's before us. I think Bill Davis would love to hear that remark. Uh, may he rest in peace, and we thank you for joining us on this program. Francis Fukuyama, Senior Fellow at Stanford University, his latest contribution to the public dialogue, Liberalism and Its Discontents. Professor Fukuyama, I look forward to our next chat, and we thank you for joining us here on TVO tonight. Thanks very much, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.